Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Good evening. Good morning, depending on your time zone, and welcome to a CLDB webinar. What's new in CLDB 5.0? Before we get started, I want to cover two uh, housekeeping items. Uh, the first one: uh, do ask question using the Zoom uh, UX. I will try to stop in the middle a few times to, to answer question, and if not, I will have time, hopefully at the end of the session, uh, to answer question. It will be more interactive and more fun for everyone. Uh, the second, the session is recorded. So if for some reason you get an emergency and you have to run out, no problem, we, we, you can watch the recording after, and we will share the link uh, right after the session or a little bit after. Um, one thing that might interest you before I actually get started with this webinar is an event that we have on October called P99. It's an event that uh, SILA helped to organize. It's, it's all about performance, as the name suggests, about latency as well. Uh, so uh, last year was very interesting, at least for me. Uh, so I encourage you to check it out uh, and register. You cannot submit talk anymore. The registration for that is end, but you can participate. Uh, uh, and I'm sure I will again. Um, just one thing before I get started, quick uh, poll about your adoption of NoSQL in general. So we'll give you a few seconds to answer. And we can get started. So my name is Zach Livetan. I'm VP product at CLADB uh, for quite some time now. Before that, I spent a few years in the telecom domain, a few years at Oracle, uh, but that's not relevant for now. Today, we're going to cover a little bit about the history of what led us to 5.0 and, and some of the history of the feature that, and why we developed them. And then um, the main part of this session will be the theme of um, CLDB V, as I call it, I will explain what it is in a second, uh, resilience, performance, and ecosystem. And then at the last uh, slide or two, I'm going to talk what's our plan uh, for the future. Uh, just one word about CLDB 5. So um, the latest open source release of CLA is 5.0, and CLDB 5 is a nickname we gave all of 5.x releases. So some of the features that you're going to see here and I mentioned them are part of 5.0, other is production or experimental. Some of the features are not in 5.0, but will be part of 5.1 or 5.2. And I have a small roadmap icon that I will show you that you can uh, clearly see what is available and what is not available. So for those of you who are not familiar with CLDB, CLDB is a data, NoSQL database designed for high availability and high performance, and by performance, I mean both throughput and latency, and I will touch on both of them later. Uh, CLADB come in three variants, uh, open source, which is the focus of this session uh, with the CILA, uh, the B open source 5.0 release. And we also have an enterprise release, which closely follow the open source. The upcoming enterprise release 2022.1 will be based on 5.0, and we have um, a popular, very popular, at least uh, lately, cloud offering, which run the Scylla enterprise, but in a managed way. So we completely manage the database for you, either on AWS or on GCP. We're doing the monitoring, the upgrading, everything that come with it. And this option become more and more popular each day, as I mentioned. A list of our users and our customers. Um, let's not uh, spend too much time on it right now because we have a lot to cover. Um, so, yet again, a little bit covering of the history. So, in the last 15 years or so, hardware has significantly changed. And when I'm saying hardware, of course, it can be physical machine, bare metal, or virtual, as most people use these days. And when the NoSQL trend began somewhere around uh, 2005 with Cassandra or MongoDB, Hardware was very different than today. Most servers have one or two cores, not a lot of RAM, very slow disk. SSD was just beginning, and everything is different today. As a lot of you probably know, servers today have very efficient SSDs, as we'll see later with the i4i, for example. 
uh, a lot of core per machine. You can easily get a 96 or 64 core machine on AWS or GCP, very fast network. And uh, latest uh, and greatest, I would say, NoSQL database was designed from scratch to take advantage of this hardware. And in particular, Scylla was designed with performance, I would say, is the focus of the, of the open source project. And in particular, low latency and low consistency latency. And we'll see how 5.0 is based on that and even improve. Uh, so the journey to 5.0, I would say Scylla is, exists for about eight years. Uh, initially, we started uh, with the focus around performance. We have a shard per core architecture that allows Scylla to scale very nicely on a large machine with multi-cores. The next step was to complete uh, the API, and Scylla is now compatible with both Apache Cassandra and AWS DynamoDB. And the last uh, was to complete integration, add features, uh, Kubernetes, Kafka, Spark. I will touch on a few of those uh, later. And with Scylla 5.0, we, we take everything we did and we add to that. We add easier admin, even better performance, even better resilience, and I will cover all of them in a minute. As I mentioned, Scylla, the B Enterprise is based directly on the open source with some extra feature around security and performance. So everything that you see here, and I mentioned it's part of 5.0, it will be part of 2022.1 that will be released actually in the next few days even. And so there are a lot of, of new features in 5.0 and 5.0x in general. I'm not gonna cover all of them. And the feature I do uh, going to cover, I split them into three partitions, if you will, uh, following NoSQL terminology, resilience, performance, and ecosystem. As you will see, this categorization is somewhat artificial. Some of the feature can be a place in resilience or performance or both or even the three categories. So, so please take this category as a, as a like a high level guidance it's, and every feature might fit to more than one. And we'll start with resilience and we'll start with strong consistency. Uh, raft-based consistency that we added in 5.0 for both schema and topology. So let's start with a quick introduction to Raft. Uh, I, I won't deep dive into Raft. I just want to explain what it is. And, and if you're interested in exactly how it's work, I highly recommend learning it. Uh, I actually did a webinar with Kostya, our, our lead Raft developer a few months back. And he really deep dive into the Raft implementation. So if you are interested, I encourage you to see that. Raft on a very high level and a simplification is a consent, distributed consensus algorithm. It's allow a distributed system to move forward in a serialized way between state. As long as a quorum of the nodes of the machine are available, the state machine can move forward. And what Raft guarantee to you is that all the nodes in the cluster see the same a view in the same order. Of course, um, in a distributed system, you cannot guarantee that at the same time, but everyone will see this, the same change in the same order. And, and this is a very useful property. We spent, I would say, the last year and a half or so to implement Raft and mostly testing it and validate uh, it's do supply this guarantee. So it's, it's a can keep a consistency across multiple failure in network, in nodes, etc. And once we completed the work and it's finally available, we started to move a Scylla feature one by one uh, to use Raft. And this is what we did in 5.0. Uh, specifically to, uh, to Scylla DB, the implementation which we created from scratch was tested for very large cluster, was tested for uh, asymmetric network failure. When not one node can see the other one, but not vice versa, which of course can happen and uh, other tests and implementation that is unique to, uh, to ScyllaDB. So we didn't took a third party Raft implementation for that, we implement our own. Uh, so now that we have Raft, I want to present two problems that we are solving with Raft, uh, which both are, can be uh, the same bucket as metadata consistency. So as you know, Scylla use eventual, or you might not know, but Scylla use eventual consistency for the data itself. 
Uh, but uh, you might don't know that Scylla use gossip for metadata consistency. Uh, gossip is a popular protocol in distributed system and it's having advantages, but also disadvantages. And I will show you one of these uh, disadvantages right now um, when we're talking about schema updates. So schema updates can be any uh, create table, alter table, create user defined type, and anything that's related to the schema, not to the actual data. Of course, if the schema is not in sync in the cluster, you might uh, fail in reading and, and writing data as well, because when you write a data, it has to match the schema. So it's not completely disjoint from the data itself, but it is using a different uh, consensus algorithm, so for gossip and now raft. So let, let's first see the problem and, and then explain how we fixed it. So let's say that you have application that doing an alter table. You, you do that from time to time. Uh, the information propagate using gossip in the cluster, uh, meaning that each node randomly send the update to another node. And of course, this work fine in most of the cases, but in some cases, the application will send another altered table, maybe to the same table, maybe to a different table, and then you might have a collision. Um, so in most cases, this will actually not be a problem, especially if you change two different tables, no problem. But on some cases, it is a problem. Uh, let's say that you have an application that, or two application, both of them are updating the same table and update even the same column ID. Of course, there is, there is no good way to consolidate this information. And then you have a schema mismatch. And if you're working long enough with Scylla or other databases, like Apache Cassandra and other, you might hit this problem. You cannot really, with a database with a lot of user and a lot of application, you cannot really control what users are doing. So it's likely at some point, uh, two users will decide to, to update the same uh, schema for the same table, and that might lead to a schema consistency issue, and, and uh, you will get error when you try to update the schema, but you also might get error when you try to update values or data in the database. As I mentioned, if the, if the schema does not match the data, you will get an error as well. So this is, a, I wouldn't say a common problem with Scylla, uh, but it does happen uh, from time to time, especially on large cluster with a lot of different application, maybe in different regions, when you have a lot of latency between the data center. And this was an, an ongoing problem that manifests with different issue in Scylla. So with this, with Raft, this issue is solved. Uh, Raft take care of updating the schema. So it's first validate that all the nodes in the cluster see all the updates in the cluster, in all the uh, schema updates in the cluster in the same order. So the, the updates are serializable and all the nodes see this, the same update in the same order, not always at the same time, but the same order. And that's what serialization means. Um, every update either completely succeed or fail. Okay, so you wouldn't have part of the node with one schema, part of the node with other schema. And once all the cluster agree on a new schema, then you can start accepting rights uh, to the new schema. So Raft uh, completely fixed the, the schema synchronization issue. Uh, and that's already available in 5.0 as experimental feature. So if you want to take it for a spin, download the latest open source version 5.0, enable the Raft experimental feature, and you can enjoy schema update with Raft. By the way, if, if you, if you want to, and I actually encourage you to do that, uh, don't enable the, uh, the Raft uh, experimental feature first and try actually try to get to a state of, uh, of schema asynchronicity just by doing a parallel update. It's not trivial, but if you try hard enough, you can get there and then you can try enable Raft and try it again. Uh, so this, this is one part of, uh, of uh, the first feature that we implemented on top of Raft, schema update. The second feature, which is also a metadata in the cluster, is topology changes. So first, let, let's understand what is topology, why, it's, why it is important, and what problem do we have, and then how we fix it with Raft. So first, what is a topology? Topology is information about all the nodes in the cluster, which node is in which data center, and which node hold which part of the token ring. So as you might know, Scylla and other distributed database split or partition all the data in the database into a partition, and each group of partition in Scylla case called a range of token ring. 
Uh, you, you can imagine all the, all the values in the database on the ring and what Scylla does, and, and again, it's not unique to Scylla, is split these partitions between all the nodes and each nodes know the, the full topology of the cluster. So for example, node A know that is responsible for the blue uh, partition, node B the red partition and node C the stronger blue. By the way, I'm completely colorblind. So I'm just guessing the color here. So bear with me. Um, so each node note knows and holds the full information. So if a request for update come to the cluster and in seal all the nodes are symmetric, each node will know if uh, this specific partition is under his ownership or we need to send it to another node. Um, so that's how it works and it's work nice. But as you can guess, it's very important to keep this information in sync between all the nodes in the cluster. Because when you add another node, in this case, node D, uh, this information currently propagating gossip, like we mentioned before for, uh, for schema update. And the distribution of the token ring between the node change. So node did take part of the ring and the other nodes stream this information to the new node. Uh, this works nice in most of the cases, but what if when you add the node, you actually have a node down, node C in that case. When this node came back to life, you will temporarily have a different view of the cluster and you will not know that D took part a part of the ring and will, it, there will be a mismatch between who is owner of which information element. Uh, so this might not, again, might be not a very common issue with Scylla, but it do happen from time to time. If you carefully read Scylla documentation, it actually suggests to you not to start a new node when you have a node down or, or an unavailable node. So this is a good advice and you should follow that, but, but keep in mind that even if you use node tool status, for example, uh, you might have a, a specific view of a specific node and other node does not share the same information. Uh, uh, and on top of that, nodes can go up and down unexpectedly. So you thought all the nodes are up, but when you actually add a node, one of the nodes fail for a second or a minute or an hour, and this is very hard to control. A second problem that we have with uh, the way that uh, Scylla work right now, the, Scylla actually limit you because of this problem and because the information is propagated slowly sometime between the nodes. And when I'm saying slowly, I'm talking about milliseconds, right? Uh, Scylla only allow you to add one node at a time. If you will try to add two nodes, if the information already propagates, Scylla will uh, disallow you. If by chance you are able to do that, uh, for example, in two different data centers and trying to add two nodes exactly the same time, it might succeed, but again, lead to asynchronicity in the distribution of the token ring. So let's assume for now that you do add node one by one and you do it carefully. So once you add a node, uh, uh, all the other nodes recognize it, the cluster redistribute the information and actually start streaming information to the new node uh, because the end goal of, of this streaming is that all the nodes now will have the same amount of data between them. So every node that you add, you have to stream all the data to the new node. Uh, this process actually might take uh, hours because imagine that each of the node have uh, 10, 20, 30 terabyte of data, which is, which is very uh, feasible with Scylla. Streaming even part of it, like 10 terabyte to a new node, take time because you have bandwidth limitation and you have storage limitation, it just take time. So if you think about it, when you need to add three nodes and you do it one by one, you actually stream in parts of the data three times to the first node you added, to the second node you added, and the third node you added. So on top of synchronization problem that we described earlier, the current limitation of adding node one by one, which is the only way to use Scylla right now, actually take a much longer than required because it streams the data three times instead of just understand as you add in three new nodes and then you can stream all the data uh, to all of them at once. And as you expected with the introduction of Raft and with the re-implementation of a topology update through Raft, this is now available. So you see the roadmap icon on the right. This is not yet available in 5.0, but it is available on master and will probably be experimental in 5.1 and 5.2. 
Uh, and once uh, you enable Raft for topology changes, you can actually do transactional update to the cluster. So you can add, for example, three nodes in this data center, remove two nodes in this data center, and all of these changes are guaranteed to happen together or fail together. And so everything become much more efficient, streaming becoming much more efficient, and scaling become much faster. Because if you want to scale your cluster from three node to nine node, you can do it with one operation. You don't have to add node by node by node, which sometimes take a long time. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, the split between resilience and performance is not clear because in this case, uh, resilience, if you will update, also lead to much better performance and, and lower time for adding nodes. And this is how the data can stream directly from the original node to the end node in case you have such transaction. With Raft, we have uh, such transactions. Uh, the last part, which is uh, the last, not the last, but the next feature that we're going to implement on top of Raft is tablets, uh, which is uh, using the Raft not just for metadata schema and topology, but also for the data itself. Uh, it's, uh, this will allow us to uh, replace, for example, lightweight transaction, which is the current mechanism to do transaction uh, in Scylla, and it's work and it's work fine, but it uh, it's have a lot of redundant messages. So the performance are not as good as we want to. Uh, with Raft, we will be able to implement lightweight transaction in a much more performant way. And also implement other features like uh, material view synchronization and other uh, using Raft, but that's uh, not, not, will not be available probably in 5.2, maybe 5.3. Uh, so that was about uh, strong consistency. Let me quickly check if there are uh, any questions before I jump to the next topic. Maybe I will answer one of them. So there is a lot of question on, on what is uh, SILADB V versus SILA 5.0. So well, let me quickly address that again because it, it might be confusing. SILA V is basically a roof name for everything 5.x. Um, so uh, some of the features are available in 5.0, some will be available in 5.1, 5.2, etc. Scylla DB Enterprise 2022.1 will be based on 5.0. Uh, Scylla DB Enterprise 2022.2 will be based on 5.1, etc. I hope it answers the question. If not, we'll get back to it later. Uh, how does Raft-based schema management handle concurrent schema change? Um, it, it, so the Raft is deployed across all data centers. So Raft will make sure that uh, the, that the schema change is serializable across all data center. So in other words, it's completely safe to do that and will either succeed or fail across the entire cluster. Um, okay, let, let's uh, switch to the next topic, which is actually related to what we talked about earlier. So I already mentioned uh, that when you add a node, but also when you remove a node, you need to do streaming of data to rebalance the data between all the nodes. So the, the, at the end of the process, all the nodes have roughly the same amount of data. I already mentioned that this might take hours in case you have a lot of terabytes of data. Uh, and the problem with the current implementation is that uh, this streaming is fragile. How is it fragile? It's fragile if it's stopped in the middle for some reason, you have to start from the top. Uh, and if you uh, streaming, I don't know, 20 terabytes of data and you have to restart them again and again, if you have network issue, you can imagine it's very frustrating. That's the first problem. The second problem, and, and again, it, that's, that's well documented and you should read the documentation that after you add a node and the streaming is done, you actually have to run a repair to make sure the data is synchronized. So these two problems are fixed in a SILA 5.0 with what we call repair-based node operation. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, repair is a mechanism that we have in SILA to synchronize offline between uh, two nodes in case they are not exactly, uh, they are out of sync for some reason, which can happen. So it's a mechanism that we have for a long time and we have a lot of optimization to improve it. Uh, like a uh, robust repair and other. And what we did in SILA 5.0 was we actually reused this, the underlying repair mechanism to do streaming as well. And that, that gave us a few advantages. As you can guess from the problem I described earlier, 
So one of the advantages, uh, this uh, streaming is now, re, uh, you can actually resume it from where it stopped. So if you have a network hiccup during the streaming, you don't have to run everything again. <coughs> Sorry, you can just continue it from where it stopped. Second is uh, guarantee consistency. So uh, you don't have to run repair after. And it's also simplify the code itself because we're using the same mechanism. Sorry. <coughs> Let's hope I can continue talking until the end. Uh, off strategy compaction is an optimization that we added uh, to actually improve this uh, repair-based operation. We noticed that the repair create a lot of small SS stable and it's take time to compact them, especially if you try to compact them together with all the other SS stable which are already on the node. And the off strategy compaction is, is taking all the SS stable, the small, usually small SS stable that was created from streaming, compact them together and reshape them to the shape of, of the other SS stable and then only then merge them to the rest of the SS stable. Uh, that another performance improvement that we did following the repair base operation. And we have more features around the uh, uh, out of memory resistance and exception handling and many other features that help uh, resilience, but I will, in the essence of time, I want to move forward and I want to move to performance related feature in 5.0. And the first one is a new IO scheduler. So before I explain what is the new IO scheduler, I want to quickly explain uh, what is the old IO scheduler. Uh, so why do we need an IO scheduler in general? So database, as you can imagine, database, uh, the storage part of the database is super critical. And a lot of what the database is doing, uh, true for other applications as well, but especially for databases, is written and writing from storage. And, and still I actually have a lot of, uh, not a lot, but they have different type of internal consumer or processes that use IO. So of course there is the read and write that the user send over SQL or REST API, but there are also processes like compaction, the read and write from the disk, there is repair that I mentioned earlier, the read and write from the disk and other operation. And the IO scheduler take all of these uh, processes schedule them according to SILA logic and only then send them to the storage. And why is it important? We want to control, completely control the priority in which every a process a get when you go to the I. We don't want to let the, uh, the SSD or the operating system control our priorities. For example, uh, if you have a lot of online requests, we don't want the compaction to take uh, too much resources and slow you down. If we're using repair, we want repair to have a, a low amount of share in the process, again, not to slow down online requests. And maybe if compaction is, is a leg behind, we do want to give more share to compaction. So the logic, uh, we implement the logic, but it's very important we, we have full control of the storage and the priorities of the request to the storage. And this is why we have scheduler in general, and in particular, a IO scheduler. Uh, this is something that uh, the scheduler in general is implemented in SILA uh, for quite time, a few years now. And uh, the first implementation was uh, uh, to first, uh, and, and this is actually actual result that we got from disk. Uh, when you try to send a lot of requests to, to a storage, especially SSD storage, if you try to, to send too many concurrent requests, you will uh, soon see, and we measure that again, uh, that uh, at some point, which I, I, I like to call the storage sweet spot, if you send too many concurrent requests, you won't get any performance improvement. As you can see in this specific disk, the sweet spot is 100 concurrent requests. If you send more requests than that, it will still work, but, but all the requests will just pipe in the queue in the SSD itself. The SSD, of course, also have a queue. Uh, and usually with more software application, I, either the OS queue or the SSD queue hold all, if you send too many requests, it just queue on the disk. And usually it's not a problem, but why, why it's not a good choice for SILA? Because as I mentioned earlier, we want to control the priority of the, of the storage request. And if we just queue them on the storage, we lost all control of them. So the storage will just fetch requests and handle them one by one, but we cannot give them priority. 
So this is something that we recognized a while ago uh, in earlier releases of Scylla, and before you start Scylla, we're actually measuring uh, the specific sweet spot of each disk and inject this logic into the IO scheduler, and that's used to work fine with some limitation, but in latest release of uh, with that latest uh, storage, we found out this is not optimal. Uh, so instead of just measuring the, the sweet spot in term of concurrent requests per second, we are doing more than that. And we're actually uh, running a benchmark on each storage type that measure not just a point, but entire matrix of, of uh, value differently for reads and writes and for different bandwidth uh, and throughput. So we are not finding just a specific point uh, number of concurrent requests. Uh, we actually have a capacity limit, which is different for read request, write request, bandwidth and throughput. Uh, so this model is much more flexible and we were able to get much better performance out of latest SSD with this uh, new model. Uh, by the way, if you are running on AWS, for example, we, we already have a hard or not a record that we pre-measure all of the storage, the i3 storage, i4 storage, and, and Scylla Logic already have this information. If you are running on your own hardware, the Scylla setup will run this benchmark the first time you install Scylla and recognize all of this parameter by itself. So you, you don't have to do anything in particular, uh, but it's take a few minutes on the first installation. In AWS, uh, it, we shaved off even this uh, few minutes. And the new scheduler, as I mentioned, take more, more points uh, in, the, in the storage and able to take advantage of later storage. And I will show examples soon. Uh, one thing that uh, the new schedule will allow us with this operation between read and write, uh, let me skip ahead. It's uh, actually to uh, handle a operation much better, especially when you run an operation on an online request. I'm going back to the previous example that I gave of adding a node or replacing a node in the cluster. So when you scale the, the cluster up, I already mentioned that you have to do a lot of streaming. So this streaming, at least on Scylla 4.6, as you can see, actually affect the IO and the, number, uh, and the latency of the online request. It makes sense because you are stressing this. You are sending a lot of information over the network. You would expect it will have some effect on the online request, but this is something that, is, at least in Scylla, we don't like to see. Uh, one of the things that we are take pride of is consistent uh, tail latency. And if you look carefully at the, the P99 latency while you are doing streaming, you would see it's, it's not great. It's still better than other databases, but it's not great. Uh, so in 5.0 and 5.1, we greatly improve on that. By the way, 4.6 is better. Even 4.6 is now better than what you saw earlier because we fixed some bug there, but I want to show the, the great, latest and greatest result. So this is again, uh, uh, Scylla request per second and Scylla latency during, a, during an add node operation or replacing a node. As you can see here, the number of requests per second is almost uh, stable, ver very stable and, and constant. And if you look more carefully at the P99 latency, you would see it's very, very low. So much lower than before. So what we got here is during an extreme operation of, of uh, in, uh, scaling the cluster from two nodes to three nodes, while the nodes are doing all the streaming, online requests still get priority, and as a result, get a very low uh, tail latency. Uh, so this is a test that we did to prove that the IO schedule actually doing the work. As, as you can see here, it's uh, work even better than I expected at least. Uh, so scaling up and scaling down uh, become much smoother operation uh, if you look at, uh, at the latency. By the way, the latency that, that we show in here are coming from the client, not for the database itself. In this case, we use Cassandra Stress. Um, so we talked about the IO schedule and performance. And one more thing, that, that another nice surprise that we have from AWS is a new I4I instances. Uh, I wouldn't say that we developed them, we got them from AWS, uh, but when we tested them, especially with the new IO scheduler, uh, it was very easy to see, as you can see here in this diagram, that the storage, the new storage of the I4I is much, much better than the I3. Of course, the CPU is different, everything is different in these instances, 
Uh, but specifically with Scylla 5.0 and the new AI scheduler, uh, we were able to, uh, to test the new I4I instances and we got more than twice the throughput, which with lower latency actually, uh, than what we got on I3. Uh, the price I think is a little bit, still a little bit higher between I4 and I3, but the price per 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 performance is much, much better. Uh, so this is something which is not yet available on all regions, but if you are, if you can get your hands on an I4I and then Scylla 5 or Scylla Enterprise 2022.1, certainly the I4I will give you much better uh, performance uh, to cost ratio, and we will soon launch it and make it available on Scylla Cloud as well. Uh, so I would say AWS did most of the work, but uh, with uh, Scylla a new IO scheduler, we are able to take advantage of this new great hardware. Another, let, let me check the time, sorry. Okay, I think we are good. Apologize if I'm, I'm talking uh, too fast. I, I will make a break after the performance part to uh, answer a few more questions. Uh, so uh, two more things that we greatly improve in 5.0 is, is large partition improvement and reverse query. Before I explain what are this imp improvement, I want to quickly recap what is a partition, what is a large partition. Uh, and I'm doing it very briefly. If you are interested to learn more about Scylla data modeling, we have a Scylla University live event coming up. I will talk about it at the end. Uh, so here it will be pretty brief. So I already mentioned that Scylla split the data to partition. Each partition in Scylla can hold many, many rows. Um, in this case, for example, the ID is a UUID, and, and each row contains a, a timestamp and a heart rate, timestamp and a heart rate. You can imagine this is kind of an IoT device, a database or something like that. Um, all the rows in the same partition are ordered by what we call a clustering key. In DynamoDB, by the way, it's called ordering key, which actually is a better name, but we call it a clustering key. Uh, and this clustering key is order uh, either in ascending or descending order. Uh, a partition can become very big. Uh, so on some data model in the partition can be one row. And in some cases, like in this case, a partition to grow to hundreds, millions, or hundreds of million rows. And in the past, uh, such large partition was a problem for Scylla. Sometimes the compaction breaks, sometimes the caching was breaking and things like that. And in Scylla 5.0, I'm happy to say that uh, we fix the last problem with large partition. So it's now completely safe to, uh, to use as large partition as you want to. The last problem that we needed to solve is the way that we represent um, the indexes of a partition in memory. So in earlier release, all the index was in memory. And in Scylla 5.0, we actually uh, implemented and when I say we, I mean in Tomek, implemented an adaptive a tree of indexes. Some of the indexes are in memory, some of the indexes are in disk, and the, the caching actually can change according to the read request. And the bottom line is we can now, uh, Scylla can now support a large partition as we want to. Another related, somewhat related problem that we had in Scylla is what we call reverse query. So I mentioned that the clustering key uh, have an order, ascending or descending. When you create a table, you define the order. And as long as you read according to this order, everything, what we call forward query, everything works fine, even in previous releases of Scylla. But what happens if from time to time, you need to do a reverse query. You try to, to query the partition in the reverse order. And then if you try it on 4.6, it will get a very bad result. Uh, the performance are not great, especially, especially with large partition. Uh, so this was, not, I wouldn't say it's a common problem, but some customer and user hit it and, and it's completely fixed in 5.0. By the way, if you always uh, doing reverse query, you might just change the key on the table. But if you do have query, most of the query in forward and some of them in reverse order, you want both of them to get reasonable performance. And this is what we have in 5.0. And last, uh, we. Uh, we uh, did a, a big benchmark that took us some time of uh, testing Scylla with a petabyte of information or a thousand a terabyte um, and try 
the throughput and latency of on a, such a big cluster with a petabyte, which is a lot. As you can see here, and you see both P99 and, and the 50% uh, latency, even with 5 million, 6 million requests per second, um, latency is very, very low and pretty consistent. Of course, at some point it started to increase, uh, but not by much, and just the P99. Uh, so it's, it's completely uh, safe to run even petabyte and many petabyte of data on Scylla. Uh, before I jump to the next section, let's quickly see if we have more questions. Uh, do you know any big customer uh, that runs Scylla 5 on production? Uh, so I need to look into it. By the way, most of the customer are running the enterprise version and the open source version is, is completely available, but we don't have full information of who is running what. Uh, so I know, I know that uh, some users already operate to five and I know that because we, they already reported and even opened a few issues. Uh, so I know users are moving to it, but it's hard for me to estimate the rate. Uh, did you benchmark a legacy streaming between uh, row level repair? Yes, we did. And we we'll soon publish it in a blog post. I actually didn't have time for, to present everything here. How about this performance on GCP? Um, so I have I have a thing to say about it, but let me skip it on, on this uh, session. I would say that e each cloud provider and each disk have completely different properties. Let, let me put it this way, and you need to, to measure each independently. Uh, okay, the last part I want to touch is ecosystem, which, which are feature which are both on Scylla, but also outside of the actual core database. Uh, the first I want to mention is the Rust driver. Uh, so Rust is, is uh, very popular these days, uh, especially with people or engineers that uh, care about uh, latency and performance. And just by chance, it, it, this group overlap with uh, Scylla user. Uh, which also care usually about performance and latency. And this is one of the reasons that we decided to re-implement uh, the driver from scratch. It also gave us an opportunity to actually write uh, the driver from scratch with latest technologies. And this is what we did. Uh, the driver is completely async. It used the Tokyo uh, library, if you're familiar with it, for asynchronic communication in Rust. And performance status we did actually prove not surprising, but it's proved that this driver performed better than uh, existing uh, driver. It actually also have nice, uh, as anything that you write from scratch after learning all the other driver, it's, it's have better safety property that Trust have and, and better, we think better implementation. And we are so happy with it that we plan to base other driver on the Rust driver. So we plan to re-implement, for example, the C++ driver, the Python driver, to use the, the same binary that, that the Rust generate and link it to, uh, to the driver. And that's a big effort that already started, but will uh, continue to go on in the next uh, releases. We are also working on user-defined function in WebAssembly. Uh, again, this is a, a, a roadmap feature, but it's actually already available on the nightly build. So if anyone is brave enough to start playing with this, you're more than welcome, and we would like to hear your feedback. Uh, so what is WebAssembly? Uh, WebAssembly, you can think about it as, as a binary code that uh, is compiled and run either on your browser, in this case, in a Scylla defined function. This is how a WebAssembly look like. For, for some of you, it might remind like a Lisp code, uh, but it's not really Lisp. Uh, and uh, once this function is defined, you can, uh, can actually use it from Scylla. In this case, I'm, I'm doing, using the Fibonacci or Fib function from a Scylla select. Uh, so latest Scylla version, the, the nightly build, not a formal release, or already have user-defined function in both Lua and WebAssembly. And by, by the way, you can gen or compile Rust that I mentioned earlier to WebAssembly. Uh, so that's like a linkage between the last uh, two features that I mentioned. Um, uh, by the way, next after user defined function, we plan to do user defined aggregator, which is a kind of reducer that you, you can uh, run and actually run a mathematical function across many partitions. But that's uh, maybe for the next session. 
Second thing that uh, I, I put under the eco, uh, ecosystem uh, bucket, if you will, is uh, Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes, as you know, is, is becoming uh, the standard de facto, and, and a lot of people are moving to Kubernetes, and we put a lot of effort building an open source project called uh, Scylla Operator, which runs Scylla on Kubernetes and manages Scylla on Kubernetes. And we put a lot of effort to actually bring all of the performance improvement that we got for Scylla and make sure they're working on Kubernetes because um, it, it, sometime, and we see it with other projects without naming names, once you move to Kubernetes, you are losing a lot of the performance gain if you had them in the first place. Uh, so Scylla, of course, performance is, is the focus of the implementation. And we made sure that uh, Kubernetes will have a very close performance uh, to bare metal or VM. We also continue to improve in security and other features in Kubernetes. So we are uh, more than encourage you to try Scylla 5.0 on Kubernetes and we'll support you any way we can. Uh, so to sum up, uh, I try to cover uh, what is new in 5.0 into three buckets, resilience, performance, and ecosystem. I didn't cover everything that you mentioned uh, even in this slide, and this slide doesn't include everything that we'll have in the release. Uh, we have a lot, for example, CQL enhancement. We have Alternator, which is a Dynamo API uh, enhancement, like supporting for TTL in, in Dynamo API. We are adding virtual table for configuration, and uh, so you can programmatically change the configuration and other parameter, and many, many other things. Uh, but uh, we have limited time, and I'm losing my voice, so uh, uh, let's move forward. And so what is next? I already mentioned that uh, some of the features that I mentioned with the roadmap icon are not yet available in Scylla. Some of them are experimental in Scylla 5.0, uh, like the raft uh, schema update. Some of them uh, will be experimental in 5.1 and 5.2, and the way that usually we promote feature is first we put them as experimental in open source, graduate them to production and open source, and then backport them to, to enterprise because we are trying to keep enterprise uh, more stable. And so all of the features that I talked about will roll uh, to open source and enterprise with time. And with time, it is the next few months, uh, it's safe to say. Uh, we are continue to, uh, to work on the raft. We are continue to work uh, on performance driver that I mentioned and many other features. And before I move to the QA, I want to mention, I mentioned it earlier, we have a, a, a free Silla University live event coming up at the end of July. It's a, have two sessions. One session is basic data modeling and introduction to Scylla. The other session is more advanced. Uh, usually with topics like Kubernetes and migration and other things. It's completely free. Uh, I'm doing one of the basic sessions there. So if you want to, to see my uh, face again, uh, you can join the Steel University. If you want to see prettier faces, you can join the other track. So I highly recommend this, uh, this event. Usually at the end, we have a panel with a lot of people and a lot of questions and it's pretty fun, although it's remote. And I'm also wearing a Seattle University t-shirt, but uh, you can't see it. Uh, so let's let's conclude with another uh, poll. I cannot actually initiate the poll from here, so I'm waiting for it. Okay. So how much data uh, do you have under management in your uh, operational database without mentioning which database it is? Uh, so please answer the question. In the meantime, I will uh, switch to the Q&A and try to answer more questions in the next uh, five minutes or so. Uh, okay, how about the Java driver? Will we be based on Rust? Uh, so first I want to mention something about the driver just to, to complete the picture. Uh, first, all of the Cassandra Apache driver as well as DynamoDB driver, both of them just work with Scylla. Okay, so we, if you take uh, any driver that works with Apache Cassandra or DynamoDB, it will work with Scylla out of the box. 
But for many uh, different drivers, like the Java driver, we actually fork the driver and put their specific optimization for Scylla, uh, mostly for shard per core. So if you can, I highly recommend using the, the Scylla variant of the Java driver. Um, and um, as far as I know, no, we're not planning to use Rust in the Java driver because we want to make it, to keep it pure Java. And so we will start with other languages. Maybe in the future, we, we can do something like that as well. Um, so definitely it's an interesting idea and we are doing it for other driver, but I think Java will have to wait. Uh, okay, let's uh, switch to see if there are other questions. Uh, okay, is, is a raft, a consensus algorithm already available. So I think I answered it, but it's worthwhile mentioning it again. So Scylla uh, 5.0 already include the raft consensus algorithm and include schema update of a raft as experimental. Uh, so if you want to, uh, to use it, download 5.0, enable the raft feature, and you can just uh, use it. And, and you are more than encouraged to try to break the, the schema update over raft and maybe try to break it without raft and see the difference. As I mentioned, it's not one of the, the things that you hit often, especially if you don't change the schema much. A lot of, of users do not change the schema much, but if you do change the schema from time to time on a distributed cluster, maybe with failure and network issue, you will find uh, the consensus algorithm very, very useful for you. Um, okay, this was about a uh, raft. Um, Scylla 22.1 uh, will be considered stable for enterprise. So for enterprise releases, uh, as soon as we release the enterprise release, we consider it stable. Uh, we don't have experimental feature in enterprise. We, and and uh, from my experience, and I think from user experience as well, the open source releases are also very stable and we, we do a lot and a lot of test cycle to validate it, it is so because, of course, database is a critical element of your infrastructure, and that goes double for enterprise. So uh, once 2022 is released, it's, uh, we consider it stable from day one, and we actually immediately offer it, offering it in Scylla Cloud and start upgrading cloud customer to 2022.1. So. Uh, we completely trust our uh, latest enterprise release and we completely trust our, our upgrade process. And, and one of the reasons it takes us some time to, uh, to release uh, new releases is, is the huge amount of tests that we are doing on each release, especially on upgrade and rollback and making sure that you can always do that uh, and doing upgrade while, of course, the, the, the cluster is running, handling requests. So we are absolutely sure it's uh, stable. Yes, version five, to answer the Docker question, yes, if you go to, to, uh, to the Docker Hub, five is already there. If it's not there, uh, then it's a problem. I will look, look at it right after this session. Sometime in Docker Hub, it, it sorts the, the instances in a funny way. So make sure it's not in the page, but uh, if it's missing from some reason, we will fix it. Uh, okay, I think I answered most of the question and, and we are almost out of time. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I do encourage you to go to the, the Scylla user Slack and continue to ask questions. Or, uh, I often answer questions there and, and more importantly, smarter people than, than me are answering questions there. So you are welcome. So uh, thank you very much and uh, have a good night, a good day. <laughs>